Good evening and welcome to the September 21st, 2021 uh, school committee meeting for the town of Foxborough. Uh, we do want to acknowledge before we begin the meeting this evening that Sarah Ladani is not able to join us this evening, but all the other board members are um, in person at the meeting this evening. So when we do do votes, we can do a simple majority. Um, we do not have to do a roll call vote. Okay, before we open up the agenda for the open public comment section, I did want to take a moment and remind um, everyone who is either watching, watching at home on television or here in the meeting room with us around um, some elements of the public participation policy that is published um, as a part of our agenda every, every, for every meeting. The Foxborough School Committee desires citizens of the Foxborough Public Schools to attend its meetings so that they may become better acquainted with the operations of the programs of our local public schools. In addition, the committee would like the opportunity to hear the wishes and the ideas of the Foxborough community on matters within the scope of the school committee's authority. These matters include the budget for the Foxborough Public Schools, the performance of the superintendent, and the edu edu excuse me, educational goals and policies of the Foxborough Public Schools. One last element that I would like to remind everyone of this evening if you're planning on participating in the open public comment section, speakers must first be recognized by the chair. Speakers will begin their remarks by stating their name, town or city of residence, and affiliation. All remarks will be addressed by, through the chair of the committee. I would also like to remind everyone on the committee that it is our job as committee members to remain neutral when listening to public comment. We are not under obligation to respond nor to engage in discussion around any of the comments that are made. And if there are specific actions that come out of a comment, we will follow up in a timely manner after the meeting. Okay. Now, what I would like to do before we open up, this, open up the pu open public comment session is invite anyone who wants to participate to use the sign-in sheet, which is over on the uh, table by the door, so that we make sure that we capture your name and address appropriately for um, public record in the meeting minutes. Okay. Has everyone had a chance to sign in? As a reminder, you will have up to five minutes, um, and we do ask you to make sure that your comments and the language that you, that you use remain professional and respectful to everyone in the room. Um, the first person on the public comment sign-in sheet is Rafael Aziza Feinstein. using bureaucratic tyranny. 
based on emotion and popular opinion, not rigorous scientific research. It's designed to force parents to make decisions for their children that in good conscience they would not necessarily have made. So we're concerned with bullying and protecting our children these days, and there are anti-bullying boards and anti-bullying panel, panels. So why are we forced to accept mass bullying bureaucrats who are operating on political pressure and appearances rather on good scientific information? Our children seem to be the losers in this. They are the ones who can't speak properly with a mask, can't see their friends' or teachers' faces, who may be hearing impaired and prevented from reading lips. They are the ones who are forced to breathe air through used masks. Who benefits from this? Certainly not our children. Current data <clears throat> shows that after four to five months, the efficacy of the vaccine decreases markedly, often all the way down to 30 to 40 percent. It is a documented fact that the mandate, mandated masks will not physically stop the coronavirus. Our standard mask has an opening four times larger than the size of the coronavirus. A 500 nanometers mask hole versus the coronavirus, which is only 125 nanometers in size. So the coronavirus is four times less than an ordinary hole in these masks. I, as a citizen, just ask, what research has the committee done to arrive at their decision? Can we see this research? What scientific t data is the town using, the committee or anybody that's advising you? What specific questions and concern did anybody raise to the state, either individually or collectively, when the mask mandates came down or before they came down? If you have any of those questions, could you share them at the appropriate time with us? The worry on the part of parents and concerned citizens, such as me, is that the mask mandate is based on political pressure and the need to look like you're doing something, rather than strict analysis of scientific fact and peer-reviewed research. If you can dispel those fears with evidence that the mask mandate is both science and research-based, then that will go a long way to putting people's minds at ease. Scientific numbers and percentages, not I think or I feel, if you can't cite specific research and unarguable scientific evidence, then the entire mandate issue needs to be rethought. Please consider everything that has been said by me tonight, uh, respectfully, I have to add, as you evaluate your original position. And in the future, when you're discussing among yourselves, as a school committee, I feel that you need to fight for the students and parents, families in this town. I'm not saying you don't do it, but this is a very serious issue. And, and the coercion that's coming up, or the bullying, or the fear on the parts of some families is real. So please take that into consideration. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is Shelby Cornbluth. Rob. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I request a copy of that statement for the record? Please? Yes, thank you for the reminder. If you do have anything written, we do. We would like a copy of it to include with the. I typed up, but I could send it to the appropriate person. I have it online. Would that be okay? Is that? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for the reminder, Janet. Okay. You want help? Okay. Thank you. You're fine. <laughs> Slides. Yeah, my Takes one or no one. Thank You're you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, thanks. Good evening, my name is Shelby Cornbluth, 20 Lawton Lane. I'm here representing a, a group of us parents who are very concerned about protecting our children in the schools. Um, I have this 
uh, for you because I wasn't able to do a presentation in front of you, but I figured there's a lot of valuable information in here. So if you go to the second page, you can see why isn't the CDC following its own guidelines? If you look, the CDC published a hierarchy of controls in 2015 that talks about the most effective and least effective ways of eliminating hazards. You can see there that PPE, which is a face mask, is the least effective measure of protection. And this is the solution that the CDC and the Department of Education is asking of all of us. If you go up the hierarchy of controls, you can see that engineering controls, such as ventilation systems, HVAC, and filtration, provides much better control and are proven solutions that are far more effective than masking. Okay. If you go to the next page, why, I, we say, why would you accept a mandate that's ineffective? The next page shows um, a study from the American Industrial Hygiene Association in 2020 that showed that face coverings give an approximately a 10% relative risk reduction amongst all people who are wearing them. And in fact, face masks have been shown to protect against substances that are 100 microns or larger. That's a study published by 3M and the most um, widely used brand of face masks. And SARS-CoV-2 is 0.125 microns, so that's 800 times smaller than what a face face mask is designed to do. Going to the next page, you can see there's an asbestos abatement comparison where asbestos, asbestos is 5 microns, which is 50 times smaller than COVID. And you see that the gentleman is in a full hazmat suit for aba uh, asbestos abatement. So why would we only wear flimsy face masks? Like, what are they doing at all? If one, if one wore a cloth or surgical mask to an asbestos job site, they would be fired and OSHA would be notified. Stephen Petty, who's an industrial hygienist and research scientist, has been, was quoted, if I ever recommended in court that people, say, being exposed to asbestos fibers should be protected by wearing a mask, I would lose all my credentials. And then finally, the CDC has said it in their, on their website, and there's a pamphlet at the back which is by the CDC, and I apologize for the, um, the words on the page, but it says it doesn't get much clearer. The CDC basically says a mask does not provide the wearer with a reliable level of protection from inhaling smaller airborne particle, particles and is not considered respiratory protection. It's, this is a CDC guidance document that's on their website. So yet, why are they asking us to wear face masks? Continuing, we can look at the harms of masking. There was a German study of 26,000 students, um, adolescents and children, on masking. And 68% of parents reported impairments in their children as a result of masking. This included irritability, headache, difficulty concentrating, decreased happiness, malaise, impaired learning, and fatigue. Just today, I asked my son why he comes home every day from school exhausted and wanting to take a nap. This is a kid who worked six days a week this summer without issue and now wants to take a nap every single day after school. Something's wrong with that. In addition, this masking policy is producing fear and anxiety amongst our kids. And there's a study from Harvard University that says, science shows that early exposure and circumstances that produce persistent fear and chronic anxiety can have lifelong consequences by disrupting the develop developing architecture of the brain. You all say how resilient our children are. Are they really that resilient? The studies show they're really not. Finally, it's not finally, but moving forward, if you look back to the effective engineering controls um, by the American Industrial Hygiene Association, they talk about air changes per hour. You can see from the Collier's International Independent Audit that was um, published on September 17, 2020, that Foxborough High School and Ahern Middle School have a greater than 99% relative risk reduction just by the filtration and air exchanges in the building. The Igo Elementary School is greater than 95%, and the Burrell and Taylor schools are greater than 78%. This is far more effective than any masking policy you could ever possibly implement. So what are we teaching our students? Are we teaching our students that we should accept ineffective masking policies rather than good engineering controls and science? Like, why would we do that? It's, it's a terrible lesson for all of our children. We can also do better. 
there's something called GPS needlepoint bipo bipolar ionization. This system creates equal amounts of positive negative ions, which decompose proteins of pathogens, including COVID. There's been studies you're, that have you're, shown. Shelby, you're at about six minutes, so I'm going to have to ask you to wrap it up. Okay, thank you. So this sh study sh shows that, that it kills the particles within a very short period of time within the building. So it's even better. I'm going to skip that. So, so our goal is to ensure that the Foxborough Public Schools remain fully open all year, provide the utmost um, safe and healthy environments for our children, including their, their physical and mental health, and implement pro-choice policies in the schools. So we want to ask, does this mandate ensure these goals? Are, are the, is the school committee and the administration aligned with these goals? And if you are aligned with these goals, why do you continue to harm our children and follow this ineffective and harmful requirement? Don't you think it's time to stand up to the Department of Education and do what's best for our children? Thank you. Thank um, Mr. Canfield, I would like to just say one more thing. Um, in this packet, it also has information requested. This is information that we requested um, a week ago today, and I was just wondering when we'll be, if we requested the information, when will we expect to see to, um, the answers to our questions that we submitted over a, a, about a week ago? We have to re review that as a committee and then confirm with the school administration what information is readily available and that we can make available to you. So we will do that, and someone will respond to you this week. Uh, so I'll have a response, this, uh, a response on timing this week? Yes. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you can keep it. Everyone Sorry. can keep it. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Peterson, Wyatt Peterson. My name is Wyatt Peterson. I have a daughter who just started high school this year, and I'm going to talk about the mask mandate. I know you're all shocked at that. So. A report released by the U.S. National Library of Medicine and the National Institutes of Health reviewed dozens of studies and came to the following conclusions based on actual scientific studies carried out. This NIH report is readily available on their site. The results overwhelmingly show in exhaustively annotated scientific detail that masks don't prevent and mitigate spread of the COVID virus and they do have numerous deleterious effects. It is imperative that you do right by our children and drop this foolish, harmful, and ineffective mask mandate. I quote from the report directly, quote, in a study commissioned by the WHO, no clear scientifically graspable benefit or moder of moderate or strong evidence was derived from wearing masks. None of the higher level institutions such as the WHO, the CDC, the European CDC, or the German RKI substantiate with sound scientific data a positive effect of masks in the public in terms of a reduced rate of spread of COVID-19 in the population. It was demonstrated that both surgical masks and N95 could be penetrated unhindered by aerosol particles with a diameter of 0.08 to 0.2 microns. Both the SARS-CoV-2 pathogens with the size of 0.06 to 0.14 microns and the influenza virus with 0.08 to 0.12 are well below the mask pore size. Ordinary fabric masks yield a 97% penetration for particle dimensions of less than or equal to 0.3. No effective masks in the context of influenza virus pandemic prevention could be demonstrated. In 14 randomized controlled trials, no reduction in the transmission of laboratory confirmed influenza infections was shown. This data can also be transferred to SARS-CoV-2. A recently published large Danish study comparing mask wearers and non-mask wearers in terms of their infection rates with SARS-CoV-2 could not demonstrate any statistically significant differences between the groups. In addition, this report noted numerous harmful effects of mask wearing, including significant increase in heart and respiratory rate, the impairment of lung function parameters, the decrease in uh, cardiopulmonary capacity. Oxygen availability under the masks was 13% lower than without the masks, and carbon dioxide concentration was 30 times higher. The drop in the oxygen saturation value to 92%, clearly below the normal limit of 95%, is to be classified as detrimental to health. The report also tells us, of particular note here, a mask-induced listlessness, impaired thinking, and concentration problems. Are listlessness, impaired thinking, and concentration problems relevant for children in school? The report has this to say about that. This proven mask-induced cognitive impairment should be additionally taken into account when masks are compulsory at school. 
particularly serious for children, masks block the foundation of human communication and the exchange of emotions and not only hinder learning, but deprive children of the positive effects of smiling, laughing, and emotional mimicry. Wearing masks entails a feeling of deprivation of freedom and loss of autonomy and self-determination, which can lead to suppressed anger and subconscious constant distraction, especially as the wearing of masks is mostly dictated and ordered by others. That's all from this, that's directly from this report. So we know what the harms are, and we know that masks are useless against viruses. And I could go on and on, but I really don't think I have to. I believe that deep down inside of everyone here tonight, we all know what is being done is wrong. Sure, some well-paid talking head on TV may convince you we're doing the right thing and momentarily soothe your guilt and apprehensions, but they persist. They persist because we know we're being forced to comply with measures that have more to do with control than they do with public health. They persist because we know that raising our children in this climate of irrationality and fear is tantamount to abuse and will have far-reaching consequences. They persist because we are violating our consciences and putting our children in harm's way. And they persist because we know that treating our healthy children as a species of disease-carrying vermin is an exercise in the diabolic. Cowardice and irrationality are not principles this country was founded on. This needs to end now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Peterson. Mr. Peterson, Mr. Peterson, Mr. Peterson, yes, sir. would you uh, would you mind leaving a copy of your or a copy later if you want? Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Wyatt. Uh, and then next on is Chris Mitchell. Thanks, Rob. Chris Mitchell, Nine Spruce Street, Foxborough. I'm going to go a little off topic if that's all right. Um, just want to thank this committee. The past school committees, Bill Eukna, his municipal building committee. Um, my wife and I happened to drive through um, the borough a week or so ago and um, walked around and what an incredible job. Um, when all of this happened, the, the renovations, I was concerned back in 2007 or 8, I was in front of the school committee uh, requesting to put a garden in for Rosie. Um, when the project started, um, I talked to Bill, he said they were gonna take it, put it aside and recreate it. Um, not that I didn't have faith in you, Bill, um, but when I, my wife and I walked around there last weekend, I was in awe. You guys did a phenomenal job with that. Um, so I just wanna thank Bill, the committee, all the committees for keeping that garden um, pretty much almost intact. So thank you, that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, the last uh, name on the list tonight is Joe Perez. Hello, Joe Pires, um, South Grove Street. I apologize. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's not a problem there. Um, I actually didn't come prepared. Um, to speak like the people before me, um, I really hope that you take into consideration everything that you've heard tonight. I am here because I learned a fun fact from my daughter um, a few days ago. And I'd just like to ask the committee here, how many of you have kids in the school system currently? And how many are in elementary school? Okay. so. What I learned was my daughter came home and she had lost her mask, right? So she got a new one at school. I said, where is it? She said, well, the mask fell off at the playground. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Well, well that begs the question. Well, what do you do with these masks? You know, like what's the protocol? You know, what, what's, the, what's the policy? Um, I come to find out that every kid, when they go out to recess, they have two options for their masks that they've been wearing for at least, I don't know, two and a half to three hours or whatever, okay. Um, they, two options. Um, one is they can wear it around their wrist and play recess, um, or they can take it and put it in their pocket. And that just like blew my mind. So I'm thinking to myself, wow, you're breathing in a mask for two to three hours and there's no protocol to like do anything specific. You're, 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 I'm talking about five, six, and seven-year-olds, right? Can you imagine a five, six, or seven-year-old playing recess with a mass that they've been breathing in and out 
for, for three hours, crumpling it up and sticking it in their pocket, then running around out at recess in 75, 80 degree, 90 degree day, sweaty, nasty, disgusting, pulling a mask out of their pocket and putting it back on. That's insanity. It's disgusting, it's abhorrent, it's gross. So you're gonna force our children to wear a mask every single day for six plus hours. Yet there's really no protocol. So what I did was I said, geez, this is interesting. Let me call my friend who's been a nurse for 20 something years in Boston. Let's find out what their protocol is. Okay, before coronavirus, right, at her hospital, which is a big name, you know, big hospital, their pro protocol was, before coronavirus, was you wear a surgical mask for up to 15 minutes, max. And then you discard it. Or if you see a patient, immediately after, you discard it. And I said, well, what do you do now? She said, well, it's a little different because PPE was scarce and they haven't changed the policies and it's, all the nurses are a little upset about it, but they haven't changed any policy, so it's still the same policy, but they're issued a surgical mask and an N95 mask on a special tray, it's a plate basically, and that's theirs for, for the duration of their, uh, their shift. And they, and they get to determine if they need a new one or not need a new one. Ironically, N95 masks are a dime a dozen now, and the surgical masks, because they haven't changed their policy, they're supposed to be issued only one, however, they can get as many as they want to, it's just the policy hasn't changed. And I, and I brought to, and she has a, a small child too in, the, in a different school district, and she goes, you know what, Jeez, I've been so busy with just life, I didn't even realize this. You're bringing, you're bringing up a great point. I'm gonna find out what my child is doing at recess and what their, their, their school's protocol is with these masks. Um, so the takeaway is, is that you got a bunch of five, six, and seven year olds running around, playing recess, high-fiving, digging in the dirt, picking their nose, um, who knows? Finding bubble gum on the ground and, and touching it. God knows. No one's paying attention to them. The teachers might be, and this isn't a knock on the teachers um, or the principal, and I haven't, I just found this out, so I'm gonna make a phone call to the principal. I'm gonna find out if there's things that we can do. I got a couple ideas in my head just thinking, but I'm, I'm just shocked at the level of kind of incompetence of like, hey, we're gonna mask all these kids? And who's like making sure that they're healthy? If we're supposed to rotate masks every 15 minutes, I mean, 15 minutes divided by, you know, six hours, I mean, I don't know how many that is, but start looking at it. You know, like, I would honestly expect you guys, like after this, to be like, okay, we gave you a ton of information back here you got a couple of maybe weeks or whatever to you know, comb through it. Like you guys need to get off your butts like tomorrow and call every principal and be like, hey, recess, what are the kids doing? Tell me exactly where they're putting their masks. What, what are these kids doing with them? Is there a designated spot? Should we put an email out to all the parents? Hey, you know what? Have your kid go to, like, to school with like five masks. Um, that's, that's my point. I, I just wanted to let you know, I just found this out. Hopefully all the parents watching, listening, maybe we'll read it in the paper. They'll start asking, geez, I got an elementary school age kid. I, don't, I didn't know that he was crumpling up his mask and putting it in his pocket and getting sweaty and putting it back on for another four hours. I'm just asking you guys to think about it. Um, it really kind of threw me for a loop that there wasn't something better in place. So thank you for your time. Thank you. For thank you. Thank you. Before we round out the open public comment section, is there anyone who wanted to speak but did not get a chance to sign in? Bob, I know I spoke already. I have another topic, and it's just a question that I want to put out there. So can I come up and just ask one other question? If it's a different topic, topic, yes. Yes. Completely different topic. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Once again, Shelby Cornbluth, 20 Lawton Lane. Um, I saw the MCAS results come out today, and um, it was a little discouraging. I don't think it's surprising, um, especially in math. It looked like there was a 15 to 20 point drop across basically all grades for meets expectations and exceeds expectations, which basically goes to the learning gap that we've all 
been talking about, but nobody could really quantify it. I think this now actually quantifies that. And I wanted to ask and, and understand what the plan, or, or, or is somebody going to get together, put together a plan to close that learning gap? I mean, it was there were some grades that were horrific. My daughter is a freshman this year, so she was in eighth grade last year. It was horrendous for eighth graders, the, the learning, the, the difference between the 2019 and the 2021. Um, and so I was just wondering when that's going to happen and if you'll be reporting back. And like these, we have a few years to get these kids back. So how are we going to do that? Um, that was, that's just my question. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Once again, anybody else that didn't get a chance to sign in? Well, as always, we do thank you for your attendance and for your participation this evening. Um, we did also receive some community inbox submissions, as has been our practice. I will read the name and addresses of all the submissions. Um, those, uh, once these minutes are approved from tonight's meeting, the submissions will also be made available as part of the minutes from the meeting. Um, the first submission was from Don Kellaway, uh, 41 Cedar Street, Shelby Cornbluth, 20 Lawton Lane, Lisa Pereira, 15 County Street, Ben Tobin, 51 South Street, and then two more submissions from Shelby Cornbluth of 20 Lawton Lane. So again, thank you for uh, your participation through the community inbox, um, and these will be made available um, as part of the uh, meeting packet when these minutes do get approved from this evening. So thank you very much. Now we're moving on to our regular scheduled uh, business meeting of the school committee of the town of Foxborough. First on the agenda is our teaching and learning highlight. So Dr. Burtis, would you like to make the introduction here? Approval of minutes. Oh, sorry, I forgot that one. I was so excited. Thank you. <laughs> uh, approval of minutes. We have several sets of minutes to actually approve. The first set is the August 18th, uh, 2021. Did anybody have any edits or questions about those minutes? No. So seeing none, may we have a motion to approve those minutes? Motion to approve August 18th minutes. Second. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. All in favor? Four zero zero. Thank you. Uh, and there's another set. I have to find them. So the next one is August twenty fourth. Uh, any edits or changes to those minutes? Questions, comments? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the minutes, please? So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. Thank you, Michelle. All in favor? No. Four zero zero. Thank you very much. I'm gonna oh, that's so right. Thank here. you. So three zero one. Zero one Thank right. you. And now we are moving on. Yes. A lot of submissions. So now we are moving on to the transportation um, update. So I'd like to invite Mr. Fletcher and Mr. McClellan up to the guest table. So our teaching and learning highlight this evening is to highlight John McClellan, who is going to be our next director of transportation, but not really officially until November. So Kathy Crichton, who is our assistant director of technology, she retired last week. I'm sorry, transportation. <laughs> and um, John has is assuming that role until Mr. Fletcher Dennis retires in November. And so we are here to highlight transportation when I think about all that has been done over the past year and a half with all of the different bus routes and everything else. I'm sure you've had an eye-opening experience because John has been one of our drivers in the past. He has a wealth of experience in other areas as well. And so um, we're really excited that he's going to be joining us in a different role and uh, know that he has big shoes to fill as well. And um, Dennis, I'll just turn it to you if you'd like to say a few things. You have his um, resume in your packet as well. Hi, I'm, I'm Dennis Fletcher, Transportation Manager. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, last year was the, one of the biggest challenging years that I, in transportation history, I mean, I, I've been in transportation for 45 years now. I work for the T and now I work for Foxville Public Schools. I'm very happy to do so, by the way. Um, last year was really, really challenging for us, but we got through it. I think we did an excellent job uh, transporting the students of Foxborough and um, got them to school safely, to and from. This year has been even more challenging because of lack of help. Um, right now we have 
we're, we're full of help right now. We, we have everybody for bus routes. We don't have a lot of substitutes. We're always looking for help. So if anybody in the town would like to come, <laughs> please do. But uh, we're getting through it, and um, <clears throat> John's doing an excellent job. He, he's come right aboard uh, as far as learning. And um, like I said, that's, we're, doing a, we're doing everything that we possibly can to, to make sure that the students are safe going to and from school. Bus routes are, are pretty well said, I think, now, and, and um, I, I haven't had, I don't know, any complaints or anything like that. So that's all I really got to say is that we're doing an excellent job. And thank you for the school committee and my, your backing and my, my bosses. Thank you for your backing. I much appreciate it. Before we turn John, it to John, Mr. Yukna, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the one thing is Dennis has been here since 2009, so, um, you know, almost uh, 13 years um, working with us. Um, obviously, coming with the wealth of information from uh, the MBTA uh, and knowing how transportation is supposed to work is, is a, a huge advantage to the district. We, um, you know, Kathy Crichton Merrigan, who left, um, again had been here for quite a few years as well as his sidekick um, between two of them um, one of the the things that we've always had is that the management in the transportation department also is uh, you know our certified drivers so that obviously in a pinch they could do that but the other side of that is they know what the drivers are facing daily which I think is, is critical John um, we went through an interview process which uh, included myself the director of um, student services and one of the principals on the elementary level as there is quite a bit of connection between all of us as we deal with issues that come along um, John did very well in the interviews and quite honestly with his experience background uh, and his knowledge of the town uh, one of the most critical things is obviously for the transportation manager to understand the layout of the town um, the routes and you know where the comp complexities are within the town and uh, I think having somebody like John will, will actually help us to uh, have a smooth transition. You know, I personally want to thank Dennis for all the hard work he's put in over the years. This is not uh, a 180 day school year. We have summer programs. Uh, we do sure. things with the recreation department. We do all of the athletics and field trips. Um, a lot of night, you know, work as far as buses being out there. And, and if something goes wrong, the call goes to Dennis. Um, and bails out a bus that might be stuck on 95. Um, so I think, you know, th it's a very important position for the town. I think it's, it's, it's been well run. Um, and I look at, you know, uh, John as, as that successor and I hope very successful in that uh, role. Um, and then obviously we're in the, in the midst right now and complete, we'll do interviews um, uh, actually Thursday for the assistant uh, position. Uh, which we hope to have filled and have that person also have some time with Dennis as well as uh, with John as we do the transition. So I want to thank Dennis um, again very much for everything he's done. And I want to congratulate John for getting the position. Um, I guess I'd ask John, you know, you've been uh, only here since the beginning of the school year, but some of the things that you've seen so far and, and complexities that you see um, and how you feel uh, yeah, absolutely. it's moving. You know, like, like Dennis said, I have a lot of big shoes to fill. Um, but, you know, learning a lot, it's, it's definitely a learn, fast learning. You have to, you know, be on top of your toes with everything, follow through with everything. Um, but, you know, Dennis is, is great. He's, he's been teaching me very well with everything. And being in the bus, driving a bus, and being in the town, you know, I kind of see the, the school bus side. So we can sit there and kind of talk and, you know, brainstorm as you know being a bus driver i can say well we think we should do it this way and he's well we can do it this way so we kind of have that already you know connection mm -hmm. so i hope that i can continue and you know congratulations to dennis and see what happens thank you so much no problem i will say the other the other thing is when we talk about the beginning of school year it's uh kind of like groundhog day every single time we do this um Roots change a little. They don't change dramatically, obviously, because the town doesn't change. Student uh, body, for the most part, stays fairly consistent where it is throughout town. But um, you know, the complexities of what we do relative to you know our three levels of schools, but also having to be involved with Sage, uh, the charter school, 
um, because they are still our residents. Uh, as far as the kids that go from Foxborough to any of those, we transport those as well. It adds another layer of complexity to the, the entire process. We were back in school earlier. We kind of worked out our little bugs. Uh, the charter school came in a week later. They had some bugs on their side with uh, movement within. It delayed some of our buses because of the process, the way it works. Mm -hmm. Worked through those as well with them. Um, so, you know, first I'd like to thank the, the parents because obviously sometimes it's, it, you know, they're looking at us as to why we didn't show up or we were five minutes late or 10 minutes late, but it's, it's usually because we're trying to work out a complication within the routing um, or within, you know, our own scheduling side of things. And I think, uh, I think both Dennis and, and John really worked through a lot of that. I think sometimes, um, I, to be blunt, <coughs> I think parents think that the bus system is, is kind of like a taxi service. It's really not. We're transporting 1,800 kids um, on a regular basis. And, you know, to do that safely and efficiently, and I, and I use the term efficiently because we have to get the kids to school on time, you know, we can't afford to have a stop at everybody's door. I think Dennis over the years has done a phenomenal job trying to keep it close and reasonable, but it's not always possible um, to meet the, the needs of all parents the way they'd like us to. Um, but that said, um, we're fortunate to be in a town where that's a bus service is not a paid service. It's part of our tax dollars versus being outside of it. Um, and we also have our own drivers, which are people who either live or have been in the community for a while and people know them, which is very different than hiring an outside contractor, which can change daily and, and uh, definitely annually with drivers. Mm -hmm. So I think, again, the, the process that's been put in place uh, since well before I was even here um, is one that, that does work well for this town um, and has been cost effective and, and efficient to getting kids to school. Thank you. Well, are we, I just want to thank you um, so much for your commitment to the town, to the students, to the families. So thank you so much. Congratulations yep. on the next step for you and welcome. Um, a, so a little bit uh, deeper relationship with us. Um, I personally am thrilled that you decided to, work to, to, to join us um, again in, in get, getting our kids safely to and from school, to and from their events um, with our families in town. So thank you for, for, for working with us and joining Absolutely. us on this. Absolutely. And, and I'd say to Dennis, just thanks for your service for such a long period of time. We are, I, I think uh, we might forget how fortunate we are to have our own fleet, a responsibility for our fleet. And so uh, your organization, your management to take care of the fleet, just the structure of the trucks, and to take care of the people running the fleet and have that same fleet after school at night and pick up those, those, those pieces is, uh, is very appreciative. Uh, there are bigger fleets in the state that have many more drivers and different access and different reach and ours is ours. So um, that needed to be taken care of for our benefit of our kids. So thanks for doing it safely and You're welcome. carefully. Thank you for recognizing it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Brent, Michelle? Yeah. No, uh, just last, thanks for the, I mean, this is typical for positions like this, but it doesn't always come to fruition that you actually have some succession time and planning mm -hmm. and overlap. And yeah. <laughs> with something with literally so many moving parts, uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. So thank you for sticking around. You, thank you. No matter how much retirement might be on your mind. <laughs> <laughs> We're grateful for every extra day. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for you. coming thank tonight. You. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. So next on the agenda is our superintendent's update, Dr. Burtos. Okay. So some of the things that I would update as far as um, the meet since the last meeting, we've um, not had school students back in school. So I'm going to save that for the back to school update. So just a couple of things that I wanted to um, update aside from that are more in the area of public health and COVID and some uh, reminders. We're going to be having a flu clinic that's um, on the October the 5th from 5 to 8 at the high school gym and that's with CVS for families and students. We ran four or five flu clinics last year at the high school and uh, really well attended and so we'll have that. There's also the health fair that's coming up um, for the town as well but we'll have that one in the high school gym on October 5th. As far as COVID right now, um, as far as the town of Foxborough, if you go, it's a 2.25% positivity rate 
and we know that Norfolk County, the risk is still high. And th this is as of uh, September 21st. So we continue to update our COVID cases on our website. It's under the district tab. Currently, we have two cases and we've had 14 since the beginning of school started. Um, what I wanted to point out here is since we've been participating in the test and stay program, so that has to do with anyone that's been deemed a close contact, that's working really well. So we've had approximately 87 that have been deemed close contacts based on those uh, COVID cases. And out of those, um, they've all been negative and we've been able to keep students in school. So as a reminder, that's where CIC comes in. It's the Binex Now test. It's uh, students are tested for five days in a row. And as long as they're negative and asymptomatic, they're able to stay in school. And that's working really well. I will also mention that um, when CIC is there at the one of the schools, wherever the testing may be, that they are in their um, like hazmat suits. And I know that that has caused some discussion, but that that is CIC that's there mm -hmm. as part of the test and stay program. But again, it's really been working really well and we've not had in school transmission as a result of that with all of those tests coming out negative. So um, at this time, we know for many of the public comments that we hear that we do have the mask mandate that is in place based on DESE's implementation of um, their mask requirement for schools, regardless of vaccination status. At this point in time, um, we know that from the commissioner's policy, they've said that as of October 1st, they would allow um, if you had 80% of students in a building to be vaccinated, um, that they would not uh, be required to wear masks. We also know that we have your school committee policy that's in place. So as a result of that, whatever happens on October 1st, we would be needing to discuss that at the next school committee meeting. No changes would happen, obviously, because we have the school committee policy in place. At the same time, we've been doing our collection of data to look at our vaccination rates amongst faculty and staff, as well as our students. I can tell you that right now, at the high school, our vaccination rate um, with students and staff, that combined rate is 69.7%. And um, at the other levels, I will give the data here as well, what our vaccination rate between um, students is at the, where they're eligible for that. Eligible students, right? Eligible students, yes. So as far as our faculty and staff, I can tell you that we have a 95% vaccination rate. Um, I also wanted to share with you, uh, Dr. Arthur G, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Giuliano is our physician for the town, as you know, and has been for a number of years, Giuliano. And um, he has sent a number of different articles that's part of the the um, packet over there as well as far as data and research. But he also sent um, a statement for, and I'm going to read that. This is, as we've said, we continually meet with our public health officials for information and the research on any of the um, recommendations that are coming out from the Board of Health, from Deputy uh, Chief Tom Kinvan as well, and then Matt Brennan, who's the Board of Health Director. We meet with them as well as our nurses meet regularly with Dr. Giuliano and that helps guide as well as what we're hearing at the state level. So he um, has this statement here, and I'll just, I'll just read it. As a pediatrician in Foxborough for 45 years and a school physician for much of that time, I've confronted a number of challenges in child health, but none quite as difficult as COVID-19. Even as medical professionals, we have been continuing to try to understand the science of this pandemic and the rationale of the myriad of recommendations. We've relied on the guidance from CDC, MassDPH, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Working with masks, gloves, and yes, now goggles has not been a pleasure, but these were the guidelines to provide safety for our patients, staff, and ourselves. Doing anything less and incurring a preventable transmission would be unforgivable. Likewise, masking the children in school is inconvenient and somewhat uncomfortable, but these are the recommendations, actually mandate, state and national level. As we see more frequent breakthrough cases of COVID and increasing numbers of younger children affected, as well as it seems logical to take every measure to mitigate the spread of this very transmissible variant of COVID-19. 
The aim of all is to continue with in-person education and not revert back to virtual. And then some data from his own office. The positivity rate for July was 2.65%, and August 3.3%, September as of September 15th, 4.34%. Of the 61 positives, only one was fully vaccinated but had traveled to Disney the week prior, and two had received the first vaccine and tested positive that same week. COVID, although thought to be a mild disease for children, can cause late complications such as MSC, multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children. The syndrome is an inflammatory reaction in the body about four weeks after infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The initial symptoms often include fever, rashes, red eyes, diarrhea, and vomiting, and may get worse over a few days. The inflammation can affect the heart, blood vessels, and other organs, which can make some children very ill and indeed of in need of urgent care. And that's from John Hopkins. We have diagnosed several of these cases in our pediatric practice, making us feel it is not quite as rare as first thought. But this is strictly an anecdotal observation. I long to be able to go back to the pre-COVID times where we could actually have facial interactions with our young patients. I so miss the smiles of my young patients. Those smiles have always made my job special. This is part of the art of medicine, as I am sure is part of the art of education. Yes, we are missing out on some of our normal anemones and with this pandemic. However, these are sacrifices that need to be made to help to maintain a functional and consistent approach to education in the face of a unique and elusive enemy. I remember as a child growing up in a small city in New Jersey that our community pool was closed in the middle of a horrible summer heat wave. No one had air conditioners back then or could afford them. Why was that pool closed down and inconveniencing the population and especially the kids? It was because of polio, a deadly and destructive enemy. Our parents did not question that inconvenience as a scourge of what is also known as infantile paralysis had touched many families and they were well aware that these sacrifices were to help protect their children. Nothing is 100% without controversy, but the consensus in the mainstream medical community is that masking does help reduce transmission. I am sure some can argue this point with other studies, but as a practice and as a school physician, I will always follow the safer guidelines of our medical experts. And then he provides a number of different resources, whether it's from the American Pediatrics, uh, the CDC, um, a number of, of others. So that's Dr. Arthur Giuliano. And he is one of our physicians um, that represents the town and one of our public health. So I share that with him because um, of the different questions that have been asked and also to have the statement of who he meets with our nurses, uh, as I said, regularly. So what I would just like to also um, reiterate is that it's not just about masking and it's about this layered approach. And you know, many um, analogies have been used and one of them is that of the Swiss cheese. And if you have just one um, protection, you're going to miss something. So it's the layered factor and the multiple mitigation strategies that we're employing to be able to keep students safe in school. And one of those is masking. It's also continuing with the staying home when sick, that um, multi-symptom checker, uh, thinking about um, obviously frequent hand washing, increasing cleaning and sanitation. Uh, sanitization, I should say, opening our windows, um, fans, um, participating in the test and stay program, as I said, that's going really, really well. So happy to have that as an additional, additional mitigation strategy this year. Obviously encouraging vaccines and then the ventilation from looking at our facilities and the um, things that have been taking place with HVAC filters and other mitigation strategies as far as the facilities piece. So in the ventilation, I'd just like to have Mr. Yukna as part of this update speak a little bit to what we have been doing as well, because that is one of the multiple strategies here. And I know there's been some questions. Yeah, I think the, uh, we as a town or as a facilities uh, group um, obviously employ this, not just in the schools, but in all the public buildings. Um, one of the reasons that we were probably more successful than many communities as far as what our ventilation systems were capable of doing um, was the um, constant upkeep uh, and the money and effort that's put into that. Um, that said, that's why the study, um, Colliers International um, is in 67 different countries. There are 1,500 uh, engineering professionals. Um, they're well known for their ability to not only engineer things, but take things apart and determine if you have issues and what those issues might be. 
Uh, they were very instrumental when they came in and did the study, found some issues that we had. We were able to correct them within a week. Um, and then when they came back on their, some of their testing, they noticed that most of the stuff had already been corrected before they came back. Uh, we continue to maintain that same strategy and look at the similar items that were um, problems in the first round and making sure we're not having any more of those. Um, as Dr. Berto said, we look at this as a mitigated thing, uh, process where it's not just the air conditioning or heating systems. Um, the, our systems are basically room-based systems. They are not centralized systems. Uh, so some of the opportunities that are out there for commercial centralized systems are not available to work within our schools. Um, so that's um, one option. But the biggest thing that was available, obviously, was increasing the capability of the filtering system, uh, which we did do. Obviously, we struggled up front because everybody was trying to buy the same thing at the same time. Uh, we did buy, once we were able to, uh, a, a good quantity so that we're able to do our regular changes now much more than we used to do. Um, that said, we still uh, enforce not only on our transportation but in our classrooms that windows are open as much as they possibly can be because, again, that just increases the airflow transmission of fresh air to uh, students uh, and staff. In addition to that, we do continue still with our, um, you know, sanitizing uh, process. Um, and that's, you know, that's done, um, you know, in every single building. Um, obviously, we continue to keep PPE available as far as uh, hand wipes if anybody wishes to wipe down their area. Um, you know, students or teachers, they all have that available to them when they come in. There's obviously the uh, hand sanitizers that's uh, not only available in every single classroom but around the buildings um, to prevent uh, the spread as much as we can. And, and all of those are a layered approach. None of it is one thing is going to fix the problem. Um, and that's, you know, the reality is unless you, unless you eliminate the problem, which is COVID, um, there are multiple steps that you can take and, and we think should take. So I think in the buildings, um, again, we continue to be very vigilant uh, on our HVAC systems and um, as one of, the, one of the processes, but it's, it's not the catch-all beat-all. So, uh, but again, we're, we've been successful with it and we will continue to stay with it. Then just some other information that I wanted to share, which is about our vaccination rates and, and where we are currently. So as I had said, as far as our faculty and staff, we're at a 95% fully vaccinated, which um, we were really pleased to see such high numbers at that point. We weren't surprised based on anecdotal, but to actually find out specifically from every single staff member and cross check everyone in every building, that's where we are. As far as students, the student vaccination rates, for instance, if you go on the mass.gov site and you look at different communities and you look at Foxborough, what you'll see is the 12 to 15 year olds at this point in time um, have had uh, their first dose at 69% and those that are fully vaccinated are 61%. Now, it's important to remember that the 12 to 15 year olds and when you're seeing that, that's Foxborough. That doesn't necessarily mean it's all of our Foxborough students mm -hmm. yeah. because mm -hmm. that's just the community. And then at the same time for 16 to 19 year olds, when you look at that, it shows that for the first dose, it's 80 percent and for fully vaccinated it's 75 percent. But again, that goes up to age 19. Mm -hmm. So it's important for us to look, and the nurses have been working um, diligently on this to see exactly what our student vaccination rate is, because that information is also coming from the MISS system. And it's not going to um, encompass anyone that has had their vaccine, say in Rhode Island, as an example. So we're, nurses are checking with with every family to find out what our data really is and to be the most up to date as possible. So at the high school right now, um, for fully vaccinated, for students, it's 65.6%. Grade five and grade six, they're not eligible for the vaccine at this point in time, although we do have a total of four students that are because of you know age mm -hmm. um, is 12 and older. Mm -hmm. For grade seven, it's 57.3% of grade seven is fully vaccinated and just a little bit higher in grade eight at 58.3% that are fully vaccinated. 
So again, as I was saying before, if we look at our vaccination rate of our students at the high school in particular, and we look at our faculty and staff at the high school and the vaccination rate of staff at the high school, that is a 69.7% rate combined at the high school as of 921. Mm -hmm. Um, there's been some conversation of whether or not we should hold, a, as I mentioned, we're going to have a flu clinic if we should have a vaccine clinic. So we're in conversations about that, but we didn't want to um, have one at this point in time when there's starting to be conversation about students that could become eligible for mm -hmm. under, under age 12. Yeah. So we wouldn't want to hold one and then that happen and then not be able to capture as many students. Mm -hmm. But we are in conversation about being able to, um, what would make the most sense as far as holding a vaccine clinic for COVID as well. Um, the other point just to make is that MISS system where the information comes from the state from anyone that it's an opt out. So it automatically goes in for um, mm -hmm. students who have their vaccine done unless they've opted out. But at the same time, we're reliant on parents to provide that information. So it's really important that we can get that. And um, it, it's just, if we can't get it because it, maybe they had their vaccine in Rhode Island or they had opted out on the MISS system. So our data is, is just as good as what we're getting from parents sure. as well. So it's really important. Um, for them to provide that information when nurses are reaching out. But I know vaccination rates um, are something that we're watching mm -hmm. closely mm -hmm. and we are going, we continue and we're updating that within our own records um, daily. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Michelle. Um, so with the high school, what is the um, number of teachers and staff that's counting in with those numbers? So there would be 127 staff for the high school. Okay. And there's 777 students. 777. Thank you. Oh, is there a phone? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I'm computing all of this in my head. Um, so I know that from the Board of Education, you know, I'm looking at the implementation of the DESE mask requirement. So I can get a good recording. Um, they're talking about that more information will come out prior to the October 1st. Um, kind of deadline and it's not so much a deadline as it says the mass requirement will be in place until at least October 1st I think so, so it, it's one of those situations where people sort of look at it as it's going to end then but it's not really mm -hmm. not the way it's written have you gotten any indication as to when we're going to get more information um, hopefully not the day before uh, well, if it's been typical how we received guidance last year, it'll be five o'clock on a Friday. That's typically when it comes out. What I can tell you is they have surveyed us as superintendents asking if our high school will be at 80% vaccination rate by October 1st, which of course at this point, I'm, I'm, we're not there. And then they've asked if our middle school would be at an 80% vaccination rate for October 1st, which for us with fifth and sixth grade, even I, I can tell you the nurses have even looked for students at the current eligibility age, that if it, if it stands as it is, even for those that turn 12 in January, as an example, it wouldn't tip the scale to be able to get them to that 80% based on having grades five to eight in our middle school mm -hmm. and with our staff. Have you gotten any indication, are there any schools that are at 80% in Massachusetts? Um, I have not heard of any, no. And I know I talk, talked with uh, Jen Rosenberg and she doesn't know of any that are either. Any, any public high schools? Any public high schools. Yes, okay. not currently. I, I think that there's, there's a lot that are hovering, you know, around where we are, but, but not quite there yet. And, right. and to your point, it said it until October 1st. We, we don't know 
what's going to happen at that point. So I think that they're continuing to mm -hmm. collect information in it. Right. Okay. Thank you. And October 1st may come and pass, and there actually may not be an update. Exactly. Well, it's a Friday, so we'll probably get something at 5 o'clock. Right. 5 o'clock. Yeah. But there's no commitment based on what you're saying. I mean, I, I thank you for the no. that, if, I, if, I, if I remember. No, what, what it also right. says is that after October 1st, 2021, if a school demonstrates a vaccination rate of 80% or more students and staff in the school, then vaccinated individuals in that school would no longer be subject to the mask requirement. But it's also saying they would want to know how you're going to implement that and it would be subject to their further recommendations. So it's not very clear that it's a deadline that this is what's gonna happen at that date. Yeah. I, I would imagine we'll hear something one way or the other right. um, on or by October 1st. But then again, we have our school committee policy in place, so mm -hmm. it wouldn't be anything changing until after we would need to be talking about at the next uh, meeting at the beginning there right after the which is the fifth, is the fifth. Right, right. um so it'd be right after there so we'd need to have that as a discussion at school committee okay thank you thank you anybody else any other questions or comments about this update okay thank well, you very much just to go into the school update next yes please we'll, we'll move on to the next agenda item which is the back to school update okay we're actually we're going to start with dr mello before i do a little bit of up because she's going to touch upon the summer and our summer learning academy and what took place this summer so i know she has a few slides um, that we're going to share as well as part of that yeah so while we wait for the slides oh that was quick thank you um you might recall that when we were at the end of the school year whoops we went a little too far there we shared this with school committee and with um, the public which was our plan to create an accelerated pathway for students in the summer. Some students we noted needed a little bit more time to get to proficiency on their grade level standards because of the inconsistent learning patterns we had during the school year. So we offered this opportunity uh, to students based on some data, quantitative and qualitative data that we collected and teachers made some recommendations for students. Now that being said, we wanted to keep the groups really small, yeah. limited to 12 per class. So we invited students to come based on the list that were created by the specialists and the teachers and everybody who had input. We invited students. Some students declined, some families declined because they had vacations planned or for other reasons. So then we were able to invite different students after that. So we wanted to get our letters out early. Uh, I know I can say that Debbie Marcelonis, who is my wonderful administrative assistant, spent a lot of time reaching out to families individually to follow up and see if they wanted to participate in the program. So when we had our uh, permission slip that went home, it outlined the dates. We did get some feedback from some families questioning, could they maybe participate in just one week of the program as opposed to two weeks? We did allow people to do that because we wanted every student who was invited to have the opportunity to be able to take advantage of the opportunity, which led to some lopsided cohorts at times, but we were able to mitigate that by saying, if some students are coming just one week, are there other students who just want the second week and pairing them together within the cohort? So I wanted to show our participation rates. So when we look at the overall Summer Learning Academy, we invited a total number of students. These are uh, students who are exiting kindergarten through exiting grade seven. So rising first grade through rising eighth grade. We invited a total of 246 students. That's after initial invites and then following up on the waiting list to invite people after people had refused their uh, invitations. So in kindergarten, we invited an, um, a total of 31 students. We had 22 who attended. Now I say that, 22 returned their permission slips and attended some of the time. Yeah. Not every student did attend every day. If you recall from June, we ran the, the program for a total of eight days. Mm -hmm. It was the first two weeks of August and the program ran from nine to 12, very similar to our other summer program that we have. In grade one, we invited 36 students and we had 26 students attend. That actually put us over our target number of 12 students. However, we had two exceptions that we made because there were students who really wanted to participate in the program. The teachers who were running the program were fine with it and we added an extra teacher so that we could swing between the two groups and lower that ratio, which worked out really, really well. 
In grade two, we invited 28 students and we had 22 participate. In grade three, that was our biggest cohort of students. We had invited 45 and we got a total of 19. In grade four, we had 31 and a total of 20. Grade five, 35 with 16 attending. Grade six, 21 with six attending. In grade seven, 19 with 10 attending. So the, the net total number of students who actually participated in the program was 141. And if you think about last year and the level of exhaustion for parents, for teachers, for students, I think it was incredible that we had as many teachers come forward and volunteer to be part of this. Now, obviously, they were paid to be part of it, but getting teachers in other districts was something that we heard a lot from our colleagues that they had a really hard time getting teachers to commit to summer work. So I would like to give some applause to our Foxborough teachers who included Mrs. Roberts and Mrs. Muirhead who are kindergarten, Mrs. Walsh, Mrs. Sham, and where is she, Miss Martin who were first grade, uh, Mrs. Collins also worked with kindergarten, Mr. Gill with seventh and eighth, well sixth and seventh grade, Mrs. Trust second grade, Miss Goodrich uh, third grade, Mrs. Zietler who is new to Foxborough, Zietler I always say her name wrong, fourth grade, Mrs. Gray fourth grade, Mrs. Matthews and Mr. Gentile fifth grade, Mrs. Nagel was with Mr. Gill for six and seven. And the two teachers with the asterisks were actually from outside of our district. One was Mrs. Kai from Franklin and one was Mrs. Prococo. Uh, they were wonderful. They came in for a training session to get oriented with the curriculum materials. We really wanted it to be a hands-on, exciting experience for students, really targeted on the needs that they had, which is how we grouped students to make sure that it was really going to meet the goal of accelerating them up to where the grade level we wanted them to be. Very difficult to do within eight days, eight, eight half days. So we did our best to give them the best learning experiences that we could. One that I would like to highlight, uh, Mrs. Nagel and Mr. Gill, who had the sixth, seventh grade cohort, which is rising seventh and eighth graders. They collaborated for a culminating activity where the students used their knowledge of math and fractions to create recipes and they actually made the recipes which they had an experiential learning opportunity uh, for example if you needed a half cup measurement the half cup wasn't there what are you going to do how are you going to adjust it uh, how can you change the ratio of the recipe if you have a different number of people that you're serving and then on the english side they created a menu where they described everything that they made so the kids really uh, enjoyed that was one thing i noticed when i was there students were very excited to be here and we weren't really sure how that would be, if they would be excited. So there was a very positive vibe going through the hallways and I really thank the teachers and the families for making this possible because it was um, something that we didn't know if we would be able to pull off and we're excited that we did. Just wanted to show you a couple pictures of the kids uh, engaged in their learning activities. As you can see it was very hands-on. We made sure that there were opportunities for games. We made sure there were opportunities for collaboration. And as I said, uh, the students seem to really enjoy it and get a lot out of it. I was talking with a parent today who had participated, it happens to be a parent in our district who works in our district, and she said it was just a wonderful experience and a wonderful opportunity. So um, really glad to share that with you, how we did, and um, that we had, I think, a decent number of people, not as many as we would hope, but a decent number of people take advantage of the opportunity. So we're glad that we were able to offer it. Anybody have any questions? No, I, um, I appreciated the flexibility that you talked about when you had a couple of more students that wanted to participate and how you found a way to accommodate them. Um, and certainly thank, you know, the teachers and the families for, you know, participating and taking, you know, taking advantage of, of you know, what looked like it was a wonderful experience for everybody. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Oh, Brent, sorry. No, this may go into what's next, but then what's next? <laughs> for, for these students in terms of tracking and follow-up? That's a great question. Um, although I, I don't love that word, tracking, but... Yeah, um, sorry. <laughs> we have our... Forgive the buzzword. Uh, we have some universal screening instruments that we use at the beginning of every school year, and we've added some new ones this year so that we can get a great baseline on where students are. Yeah. We have, um, in K-8, through eight, we have a very strong workshop model that is designed to meet the individual needs of students. As you know, in high school, we have different levels and different courses, so it's a little bit different. Yep. Uh, this year we have talked about how we can use the data 
not to remediate, but to accelerate students. So we will probably talk more about this at a future school committee meeting. Mm -hmm. However, that has been the focus of our planning this summer, focusing on our priority standards, making sure the resources are in the teacher's hands to meet the various needs of kids. We always have a wide range of needs of kids. However, this year it is a little bit unique. Mm -hmm. So we have strategies that we've been working on to mitigate that, working closely with our curriculum directors and our principals and some of the technology that we have available to us. So I think we feel really well positioned to know where our kids are. Yes. Um, I don't wanna to speak too much about it, but I think there was, we feel pretty good about what we saw in the initial data that we've seen, um, but we'll talk about it at a future. Okay. And yeah. it, we're talking, all, but just as projecting, some of the, the same data collecting mechanisms that we've been using the last few years, yeah? Correct, but we've added some new ones this okay. year. Yes, which you'll definitely be hearing more about okay. in upcoming meetings. And I think, um, I know I walked through so many of the different classrooms during the Summer Learning Academy, and there was an energy, and we did worry with coming off the school year if students would be engaged and want to be in school. And really, again, like you said, applause to the teachers for the, the way they had planned the different activities and learning experiences for them. It, but just talking with the students, they were happy mm -hmm. to, to be here. So that, that part was, was really great to see and to hear. Um, from them. The energy to start the school year when we started on August 31st, we saw that energy come in at every single um, school. All five buildings, it just was an excitement to be back, to be back with their friends. We know the social piece was so important. We also felt where we ended the school year with everyone full in person really gave that, um, that springboard to make it to where it was even better um, for students to come back. So as far as our enrollment um, for this year, we're at 2,476 students. That is very consistent from, from where we were um, in the past and from you know, last year where we ended the year. We actually, from the close of school in June, um, we always have fluctuations over the summer with students that are moving out or moving in. We've seen more of that, quite honestly, in the last seven years or so than we have in past years. But it, it's a difference of 32 students um, district-wide yep. from where we ended in June. Our largest gain was students at the high school where we had an additional 15 students. And then the largest um, decrease of students was at the IGO with a decrease of 29 students. So um, again, staying, staying really consistent there. Um, the other thing that I wanted to remind families is right now the annual verification registration process, which is done online, the online registration, it's really important that families complete that. That has to do with um, receiving PowerSchool information, receiving any of the messages that go out from principals, the communications, myself, uh, if there is any kind of emergency, whether it's a snow day, that's how you receive those calls because you are in the registration system. It's also most importantly is if we had an emergency and needed to contact families, that's where we go to make sure that we can call a family if you know a child's sick and we need up to date information. It also allows um, for all of the sign offs for student handbooks, for the video releases, for taking pictures, those kinds of things. So it's, it's all encompassing and having access importantly for students to be able to be on their devices and using Wi-Fi. And particularly at the early um, levels, it's, it's parents, it's not students to, to do that. So we just really want to make sure that parents have gone and they've done that. Sometimes there's the confusion that I'm not registering my child, they're registered, I don't need to do that. It's an annual verification, letters have gone home from um, technology through the principals for those that have not completed them. But again, I just wanted to do that reminder because if it's not done by October 13th, the, um, it's gonna be shut off as far as the access. And that's so important for students to be able to have the access to technology in schools. So those again have been sent out to those families that have not um, turned those in. We had our open houses at the elementary uh, schools, which really went fabulously well. We staggered the times and what we found was it worked out even better. We did that for more crowd control, but I, I was able to, to get around to the three schools and talk with a number of families and from a teacher side and from a family, they felt like they got to talk with the teacher more 
because of not having as many people um, in at the same time. I also heard some co from colleagues in my other districts that said, we heard how you did that and heard it went really well. We're now going to follow that model, which we'll be doing that at the middle school next Good. week for the open houses. Um, it just provides more opportunity for access um, for students and then also helps with, with crowding. And then, so that's open houses coming up next week at the Ahern and then for the high school the following week. Sports clubs activities are in full swing. So those have been going off um, and really just you feel the vibe mm -hmm. of a more normal school year and the energy that's surrounding around the academics as well as clubs, activities, athletics. So a great start to the school year and uh, we're looking forward to continuing to see that even get better. Thank you. Any questions about back to school from anybody? I just had one, I, maybe this is from Mr. Yukna, because I'm actually one, apparently one of the families that has not returned my registration, so thank you for that reminder. I did get the email today, reminder, I didn't realize I was a, uh, a t late on that, but I'll take care of it. Um, is there any update on the laptop protection plan for this coming year, or is, have I, did I miss that email as well, which is entirely possible? No, that one was going, will be going out as well. Um, obviously on the elementary level, we won't be doing it because we're keeping the laptops in the classrooms um, to be used. So it's only gonna be on the right. uh, middle school and, and high school level where they get to take them. And actually I thought it was already out uh, last week, but I'll make sure that it does go out this week. So. Okay. And it, it might, I really might have just missed it. Yeah, no, it, it was very successful last year. I mean, we had a number of fatalities, if you will, on the uh, laptops that we needed to, to deal with. Uh, we were actually, so far, we've been pleased at what's come back um, after the summer um, was not, you know, was not bad. I mean, we're, we have a lot of repairs we're doing, but not, you know, um, not as bad as I think it could have been, I right. guess, is the way we looked right. at it. So, and again, the, the, the insurance policy covered, you know, most of that as well, so. Right. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else? Anything else on the back to school update? I think that covers it. Okay, thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is the superintendent goals for 2021-2022. Yes, so as you know very well, um, that is one of the functions of school committee and that we follow the Massachusetts Department of Education model system, which is a five-step evaluation system and it begins this time of year anywhere between <coughs> September and October um, mm -hmm. with self-assessment and then drafting of goals. So what I have for you this evening is a draft of my goals for the school year. And then as far as implementation of that plan, what that looks like, and then we'll have the mid-cycle review, which is typically around February, and then the summative evaluation, which then um, falls at the end of the school year and into July. So the uh, goals here that you have presented for you are they're formulated based on the Department of Ed's model as they are each year. You have also in your packet the rubric that they're assessed on from the Department of Education. And the other information that you have is the strategy uh, for district improvement because that is a key piece here that drives, that's our framework, our blueprint mm -hmm. for the school system and what we are working toward. So those goals that you have in front of you are developed based on that. They're based on district initiatives that are currently underway, the needs of the district based on um, what's taking place, whether it's, it's COVID or as well as the initiatives. And then at the same time, we're going to be going into contract negotiations this year. We have nine units and we have a number of units, um, our largest units for contract negotiations this school year. So that's what they, um, highlight and focus b below. So as the state law, we have to have a professional practice goal and a student learning goal. So professional practice goal is one that Dr. Mello and I also share together and along with principals because it is something that is um, what we've talked about a number of times here and how that continues to look different each year and move forward as we make progress and where we go with providing an equitable and inclusive environment. So the goal itself is to work to implement practices to address issues of educational equity, inclusivity, <coughs> and support the success of all students academically, behaviorally, and social emotionally. 
more than ever, we know from a social emotionally um, standpoint that that is something we've worked on becoming trauma sensitive school system and all the trauma courses, but particularly in the year coming off of uh, COVID and where we still have the needs of students are really looking to see um, assessing where are the students needs and providing those supports for students. So I'm going to be participating in a diversity and equity administrators roundtable with superintendents through William James College that takes place uh, monthly. Um, those sessions are going to be helping really look at what we're doing as a district and to help with other resources to um, support that. Obviously the professional development that you hear a lot about here with our staff and where we've continued from really moving from a, a culturally responsive environment and recognize and preventing bias and providing an inclusive environment that is continuing to be really um, the, the apex of the triangle, if you will, as far as our work and to provide for teachers as we continue to become a more inclusive um, environment. Building capacity with MTSS, which is the uh, multi-tiered system of supports. We put into place this summer um, a committee. It actually ended right at the end of the school year. We met over the summer. We've continued to meet into the school year with a, a, a team of teachers. And that work, along with an academy with the Department of Ed that we've been accepted into, is going to be the driving force as we move to this multi-year process of providing systems and it's really looking at the whole child not just the academics and what are the support and safeguards that we have for students and being able to build our capacity and leverage our resources and that will impact budgeting as we go forward when we think about things such as um, co-teaching professional development, what are the other supports and needs based on the work that we're doing and assessing. Coordinating and facilitating a district-wide um, diversity, equity, inclusion work group. You've heard about that in the, in the past. That is what we've, we've morphed one of our other committees into doing that work so that way we have better representation from every level across the district on that committee. The uh, visiting team, um, that we will have coming for the high school as part of our NEAS accreditation that takes place every t 10 years. Um, we have that for our own high school as we're doing our own self-assessment and self-study. Mm -hmm. But I am going to be participating on a NEAS visit for another community, for another high school, to be able to add to mm -hmm. pretty much, you know, our own professional growth and learning and having, I think it's always important to learn from other schools. So it's serving on a committee like that, it's a, it's a time commitment, but it's one that I think will be um, well worth the time and will serve us well as we go into our own NIAS study as well. And plenty of rest. <laughs> right. They work, they work you hard. Yeah. They do. Um, <laughs> I've actually not served on a committee before, and I think part of it is I've heard how many days and nights and all of the writing, but I, I yeah. really feel that it will benefit it the will. high school by having my own hands-on experience and working through that process too. So those are some of the, the key actions along with that goal as far as benchmarks that so you'll see the plan uh, for success, success action plan that will be presented at the end of October along with the one year action plan and then obviously our, our budgeting process for the FY22 budget. Mm -hmm. And you can see the strategies, um, the objectives I should say that it addresses as well as the Department of Ed focus indicators on the rubric for the professional practice goal. Student learning, working effectively to implement the MTSS to ensure equity, access, and inclusivity for all students. This is, it's a very large goal and it's a multi-year goal mm -hmm. as we work as a district to implement these practices. And it includes many data sources from our culture and climate survey data, which we'll be presenting that at the next meeting uh, for the K-12 Insight Survey. Because again, it's really focused on the whole child, not just the academic piece. So attending these um, academies, it's, it's a big lift as far as a time commitment, not just from myself and Dr. Mello, but from the many teachers that are on these teams for these academies that take place. Um, through them in addition to our own work group that we have going. Really looking to identify what are our tiered supports in those areas so we can continue to leverage them. As I said before, I have my monthly, I'm in buildings much more than monthly, but as far as scheduled where it's uh, with building principals, 
and really looking and facilitating that within classrooms so you have the vertical articulation across the district. And then obviously um, proposing our budget to you in, for the FY22 uh, school year and that what are the supports there that need to be in place. So you have the benchmarks there below as far as measuring that and again the standards and strategic objectives that Burgess. they focus on. I just, I just want to clarify SEL, social emotional learning? Correct. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. We have a lot of anacro acronyms and um, MTSS, DESI, right. yes, social emotional learning. Okay. Thank you. The third goal, district improvement goal, you'll see that this is one that we've talked about in the past with the uh, plan for success. As I mentioned before, it will be presented um, at the end of October. And that is that 33 member team that we've had in place to um, look at our objectives and initiatives and really identify what our pillars of success are. We've identified four that you'll hear more about as we move forward with that four year plan. The fourth district improvement goal is one that is continued from last year. And that is to provide leadership guidance and support to our administrators, faculty and staff during this global health um, crisis and proactively prepare for unexpected events and any potential unknowns that are related to COVID. It obviously has not gone away and we still are going to need to be able to pivot and respond when necessary. So some of the key actions there are continuing to provide you updates through the uh, superintendent updates here at school committee, continuing to secure the resources that we need, whether it's through uh, the grants. So as an example, the ESSER funds, the third uh, ESSER grant, sent out a survey to all of our stakeholders last week, which is required um, when I write that grant as far as where we're spending those funds. And so we had um, pretty good participation uh, on that from, from community, from parents, from across the town, and it went out to a number of different um, stakeholders. Obviously continuing to monitor um, our needs related to COVID the test and stay program and anything that's related to that. And then working obviously with our local public officials as we go forward. The fifth goal to successfully conduct and conclude contract negotiations with professional educators, educational assistants and others. The others, those, if you remember back, we've already completed them with um, custodial and maintenance and crossing guards. So this year, in addition to those, we have food service, secretaries, transportation, extended day, in addition to the biggest one, obviously, which is our Foxborough Education Association with teachers and educational assistants. And you will see later in the agenda that we'll be asking, because the contract obviously is with you at the school committee and to have you um, represented on that committee. And we'll be asking for two members mm -hmm. for the EAs and two members for the teachers. So that one is really focused on management and operations when we look at the rubric from DESE and then the policies that would go along with that. So that, that's going to be a lot of time with all of those different bargaining units. And we're starting at the beginning of October. It, typically in the past, it has been more January, particularly with teachers and EAs where we have started. That makes it harder because we've already prepared the budget and have the budget in place. And then at the same time, schedules, because those are weekly meetings with all of those groups and take a lot of time um, to be able to start that process and get to a point of ratification. So it will be a busy year. It will be. Just a quick point Brent? of clarification. Is uh, custodial and maintenance, I forgot, forgive me. Are they the same? Are They're the different. Same? That's what I, okay. Thank you. That's why I had counted wrong. Thank you. Any questions about the uh, performance goals? Thoughts? Brent? I was just going to say, I, I, I thought coming right out of the gate with DEI, I think is critically important. Yep. Um, the work that's being done across the Commonwealth and all of our schools is really giving great attention to that. And so I appreciate that you're going to be part of uh, a consistent you know, nine months work with other superintendents. And uh, it's not that we don't already have some capacity, but it seems like we need to keep continue to grow in that regard all the time. Um, so I think it's a great I think it's a great idea. Um, enjoy your knee ask. I've done many. So uh, there's some writing in three days. So if you get, get the right committee, uh, 
stay away from curriculum. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a long one. <laughs> it's a tough one. And of course, and the, all the MTSS work, you know, we had, it has to keep coming around and coming around for us to build capacity. And uh, I think one of the keys in, in this school system or any school system is to lead from the top um, with the content as well as the actions. So I think those are valuable and I think they're very valuable for us to help measure and work with you all. I think it makes a difference. So thanks. Michelle? No? I would just like to, um, oh, Brent, go ahead. I were just more uh, questions and maybe just to comment on. Um, and I echo what Rich said in terms of throwing DEI up front. Um, and I also, I. As a second point to that, I appreciate that MTSS is part of that because that's that's one of the reasons you're doing it. Um, I'm curious. Uh, the district already is matter of standard practice um, is looking at performance and different metrics within within groups. It's just kind of part of what you all do for data analysis. It might be worth throwing that in because um, it's part of the D it's part of the um, diversity equity and inclusion analysis that we already do and then I was curious if a look at some of the stuff we've heard mr. Michael Lasik talk about and you and you as well dr. Mello um, through uh, co-teaching and training on that method if that fits neatly into either goal one or goal two and I think it fits into so both. Not of advocating that you do more, but I know it's I know it's already on the docket. Yes. Of things to do, and I, for one, twenty percent of the committee, I'm also very curious, as you know. Yes. Uh, so to hear what happens with it that. It actually, you'll, it'll end up falling under both. So, as an example, this afternoon I attended with IGO teachers, those that are um, working with Lisa Deeker with okay. co-teaching and inclusive practices. And we're only, you know, a couple of weeks into school and really looking at scheduling. Where are the bumps in the road? What does it look like as far as the common planning time? Right. Going back to Mr. Michael Azix, that will fall, uh, you'll see that laid out more specifically in that one year action plan as far as part of the plan for success. And that's going to include, too, when we look at our professional learning communities and our student um, teams as far as BBST and it, we've gone back to really look at the purpose and define those teams more specifically and what is the role and function yeah. of those so you'll see really it come under both of those right no that's good and yeah I more mention it too because actually looking at those very practices with an equity lens in mind it I think it, it makes it interesting for those uh, folks who are engaged in the work so and, and you'll also hear, as what Dr. Mello was talking about before, some of our other screeners and assessments that we're going to be using to look at what do we have in place yeah. and what do we, what do we need right. as far as, particularly when we look at the social emotional learning piece of this too. Right. Well, thank you for the context. I appreciate it. That's all I had, Rob. Sorry. Thank you. So I just want to echo what Richard said as well, which I, I appreciate. Um, that you are continuing to push yourself professionally um, because that is sets an example for the rest of the school community. Um, it sets an example for the rest of us uh, professionally. Um, and it also just drives the excellence in our school. So thank you so much for that. Anybody else? Thank you. Next on the agenda, Mr. Yugna, student accounts. <clears throat> So what you have is the uh, student activity account for both the high school and the middle school um, annual vote on the committees um, to uh, continue each one of these. Uh, there have been no requests for changes from either the high school or the middle school uh, for the year. Uh, that said, within the high school, they do have the ability uh, to have a flex one or two mm -hmm. if something comes up um, that uh, students show a uh, strong interest in. Um, the reason you have to authorize this is obviously <coughs> there are there's funds involved with that, that uh, whether it's through fundraising activities or uh, participation, um, you know, monies that are raised to do something that they choose to do, um, and so therefore uh, the school committee is asked to approve the 40 um, high school uh, student activity accounts and the eight. Uh, <coughs> Thank you. Any questions, comments? Okay. Thank you. So uh, seeing no questions or comments, may we have a motion to approve 
the accounts. Motion to approve the accounts. Thank you, Michelle. Second. I'll second. Thank you, Richard. All in favor? Four zero zero. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yukna. Next on the agenda is the appointment of a delegate to the MASC convention, which is happening in uh, November of this year. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if anyone is, uh, you do have the option of attending either virtually or in person. I know Richard, I think you would express interest in, in attending. Um, I am planning on attending, but most likely virtual. Um, so is, Richard, are you interested in being the delegate? Are you gonna be attending in person? I will be in person, yes. Okay. we will be in person, so. Okay. I guess if I'm the only one, I guess I'm the delegate. Uh, All right. <laughs> yeah, I'll be there. So. If you would, okay. I'd appreciate it. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thank you. I okay. appreciate you both doing that. Okay. Thank you. So do we, need a, do we need a vote on that? Is it okay? Thank you. We have a motion to approve Richard as the delegate to the MASC convention. On the, Michelle, thank, thank you. you. Second. Brenton is second. All in favor? Four zero zero. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, next uh, on the agenda is, uh, as Dr. Burtis mentioned just a little bit earlier, is uh, appointments to the two subcommittees for uh, contract negotiations. Uh, there are two com uh, committees that we are looking to have participation in. We do want to have two members, um, in primarily for redundancy, um, on each of the two uh, committees. Um, first up, we have the Teacher Negotiation Committee. Um, my recommendation is that Brent and myself are the, sub, are the committee members on that subcommittee. Um, and the second committee is the Educational Assistant Negotiations. Um, and my recommendation there is that it is Sarah and Richard on that committee. So any questions or concerns about those two? Um, or those four appointments, I should say? Thank you. So I'm assuming we have to appoint that we have to vote on those separately. So first for the teacher negotiations, all in favor of, is it individually or is it, can we, do, by committee? We can make a motion for the two. Okay, so make, so a motion to have both Brent and I represent the school committee on the teacher negotiations. I'll move that. Thank you, Richard. Second. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Four zero zero. thank you. And then uh, a motion to approve Sarah and Richard as the committee members on the educational associate educational assistant uh, negotiation committee so moved thank you brent second. second thank you michelle all in favor four zero zero so thank you guys very much That's for good. for participating um, on those subcommittees uh other matters yes sir um i had a conversation with the town manager um and just based on timing alone if nothing else um, I'd like to ask the uh, school committee to consider the, uh, to start the process with the Taylor School uh, renovation. Um, the reason I say start it because um, I've done this for 20 years now and I do realize that even if you were to put in a submission, it's likely going to take a minimum of three years for the state to approve it. Yep. Um, it's going to take another year to develop the plan and then it's going to take the time to actually do the work. So you could be looking at easily, uh, if you started today, minimum of five years, maybe six years uh, before this comes to fruition. If you don't start today, just keep pushing the clock out. Um, I have not seen the state, um, except for in extreme situations where a building roof fell in or something of that nature, uh, accept any uh, statements of interest in the first year. They have too much that's coming at them with a limited amount of money. So they, they obviously program out to the most severe cases uh, in the state, and then they kind of trickle through over time. Uh, it took us three times on the borough project. Yep. Um, it took us multiple times on the high school project. Um, and even the IGO project was multiple years uh, of processing. Um, so. It's a recommendation on my side that, that we at least start the process. Um, I think we have proven that what we did with the Burl School um, brings it up to a new class of uh, educational capabilities uh, within the building. It was a building that obviously severely needed it, um, yeah. but the Taylor uh, is not far behind. Same age building. Um, I will say we have continued to maintain the Taylor uh, School. We've replaced the heating uh, systems. We've uh, worked on some of the ventilation stuff, but 
really when you're looking at a, a you know 50 plus year old building you're looking at major energy issues mm -hmm. relative to windows you know, fresh air intakes all of that that uh, um, need to be addressed as well as anything that goes around the curriculum itself that has changed over the 50 year period and um, so it's just my recommendation again I, I've, I've done this for the town for 20 years now and I I would feel remiss if I didn't at least tell you that I think it's you got to start the process um, you know unless you disagree that the school needs to be renovated so. <laughs> so just give uh, us one second please Joe okay um, are there any questions from Mr. Yukina on that I, I, I have one but I'll let other people go first so more uh, do we is to move it forward to that next step is is now the time for formal vote on that or just consensus or well, I, I think I guess I would recommend that the, the committee vote to yeah. start the process. The, remember, there is, no, there is no commitment by the town or the school committee um, until you get past right. um, almost two stages within right. the MSBA process. So submitting a statement of interest is just basically saying that you, you know you have issues to address, um, and it's laying out what, those, what the reasons are for those um, things that need to be addressed. Um, once you actually get to the point where the MSBA has accepted you, then, and, and just uh, maybe even two steps after that, once they say there's a financial side that they're willing to yes. deal with, then you're making a commitment mm -hmm. to say yes or no, you know, on a permanent basis. But uh, like I said, I, I just know that this town will be looking probably five to six years from whenever you decide to make that as a starting point. Well then, okay. Yeah, so that was actually gonna be my question is what is it that we need to do to get started on this and what, like, what does that require from us? I would say it's just a simple vote about, you know, to move forward with a statement of interest on the Taylor uh, Elementary School. Okay. Then I move with significant ro relief <laughs> and forethought uh, that we uh, begin the first stage uh, in putting together that, 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 that first uh, study and letter uh, to start the uh, Taylor renovation project. Thank you. Second. I'll second it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All in favor of starting that process? Yeah, it's no brainer to me. Four zero zero. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yukina. Anything else? And as far as other matters? No thanks. Thank you, Dr. Burdos, Dr. Mello. Any other matters for this evening? <clears throat> I don't have any. I think I covered them in the update. So <laughs> lots of information tonight. Yes. <laughs> I have one that's okay. relatively quick. Uh, elementary parents will notice that we are starting to implement a new platform called Seesaw. It is replacing what they used during um, our hybrid model last year, which was FPS online classroom. Mm -hmm. Seesaw allows for much more streamlined uh, school to parent communication. It's sort of a window into the classroom to share student work and what's happening. Um, and there's a lot of features that we will roll out as we need them. But initially, we are going to be using it exclusively as a parent communication tool. Teachers have different level of proficiency with it because it's new. So uh, we are going to keep our um, expectations limited for now, one to two posts a week, and then we will um, increase them as the year goes on. But uh, teachers who've used it in the past, who've dabbled with it, have had really great feedback from parents. So we're excited about rolling that out. So parents will be hearing from the building principals about that. Thank you. Mr. Reuter, any additional, any other additional items? No. Michelle? Always. No. Richard? Nothing. Thank you. I just have two. One is, uh, again, thank you for the reminder on the registration because I didn't realize I was late and I'm, it sounds like I'm not the only one that You're didn't realize I was one. late. So thank you on that by October 13th, yes. if not sooner, ideally. Um, the other one was something that uh, Sarah had actually, actually had actually asked me to mention um, through her participation with the uh, town of Foxborough Recreation Department. Um, there is a, a through uh, as our as our representative on that uh, with the with the town of Foxborough Recreation Department. I should put that in context. Um, there is a pumpkin float at Frog Pond um, on October 30th from 6 to 8 p.m. There is more information available at the town at the Rec Department uh, website and through the Rec Department. But um, just wanted to you know publicize that for the rec department so 
everybody loves a good pumpkin float. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Um, it, it, it sounds fun. She sent pictures, but I didn't have a way to, to show them. So pictures of other events like it. So um, but those are the only two other items that I had this evening. So if there is nothing else, may we entertain a motion to adjourn for this evening? Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Michelle. All in favor? Thank you very much. Again, thank you for your thank participation. You Have a wonderful thank evening. You all too.